think that humanity, all humanity, even those who are trying to do something, are, are, are in, a, in a place of deep denial. You know, it's, it's very hard to swallow any kind of information that says that the way you've been living, <laughs> your civilization, it's a fail. <laughs> you know, and if you don't cut it out immediately, you know, it jeopardizes everything, not just for humanity, but for so many other species. I, I think that um, within the council, what, what was so alarming to me, was, and, and then in my own life, having it confirmed in my work working in the polls, is that we've breached that tipping point, and we are just beginning to feel what we have done. Um, and yet still there are people who are like, no, 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 we're, we're going to tech our way out of this. You know, it will be like MacGyver or something. And, um, and even that, I think, is starting to shift where people understand that that's not enough. So for me, I think, I think I personally had to come to a place where I understood, like, the cat is out of the bag, and there's no putting it back. And I don't know how many people out there know this, but we have altered, at 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, we have altered our atmosphere, atmosphere for not just tens, but thousands of years to come. This, this is just the beginning of what will be the new normal. Now, people are talking about putting the genie back in the bottle, lowering the CO2, or at least keeping it from climbing. But we still are in this, in this way. Um, so uh, until that happens, I feel like personally, my responsibility is to prepare people mentally to be creative and adaptive. And, and you know, the things that I'm teaching my daughter are things that I think will help aid her in the, in the new reality of, of, you know, if we thought things were uncertain and unpredictable before, we have amplified that. And so I'm teaching her to, to sort of stay more fluid and not be so fixed on the way things are or should be or could be, but understand that this is how it is now and, and how to operate in the moment. And that's really a strange thing to teach your child. <laughs> you know, I, I had to acknowledge that there are not very many universities out there. I can't think of one, actually, that is preparing our students for the future. Uh, that, that they will inherit. Uh, we are still building and training students for a future that has no future. And that's kind of strange. You know, like, there's, there's peop the entire planet, for the most part, is still behaving as if we can, we can continue the way we are, that we can continue to drive our individual cars and, and you know, fly in planes. And, and, and the alternative of that, they think, is less. That somehow our, our, our life uh, style, if we did adopt a clean energy life and civilization, would, would be uh, ter terribly lacking. Um, that we'd have to sacrifice so much of the comforts that we're uh, accustomed to. And, and I think that's, that's only limited by people's imagination. Sure, may, maybe flying won't be the thing, but imagine if you had a clean rail system, high speed across country. Why, isn't that, why is that not viable? Only imagination and, and, and the, the willingness to, to, to admit that this isn't working. And so, so many people are so invested in this working the way it is that they can't admit that it's failed. It's already failed. Uh, we just, ha you know, it's, it's sort of like um, when you cut a tree down, it doesn't know that it's been cut down for days, sometimes weeks, like just because its metabolism moves so slow and we don't realize it, but we've already cut our, our we're already cut. And uh, as it sinks in slowly, you know, you're starting to hear some of the conversations about what that means.
I spent over 10 years in the Arctic and Antarctic, going back and forth photographing. And, you know, each time I would come home from an expedition, I saw business as usual, and I'd go back to the Arctic and more and more melting, more warming, more polar bears on land, uh, more anxiety. And uh, finally, in 2011, a young British boy was killed by a polar bear. And there was, there was so little ice, we could have prob probably made it to the, the geographic North Pole if we could have carried enough fuel. There was that little sea ice. And I just realized, like, it, it just hit me, you know, like, there, what's the point? I, I felt so impotent, and I felt like I, I was just part of the problem. So I went home, and I got in bed, and I didn't want to get up. And this was in 2011, and I was so depressed that uh, I just said to my daughter one day, she was 11 at the time, I said, just promise me you won't have any kids, and, you know, we'll just, we'll have a good life, and it will be, you know, it'll be what it is. And, and she looked at me, and she was like, Mom, I'm 11. How can I possibly tell you if I will or won't have kids? And she said, besides, you have to try. And it's that every day that I, I sometimes have to lean on to say, you sh I have to try, uh, that keeps me going. Be because, <laughs> you know, um, failure's not an option. And, and, and in this case, we've already failed. So the, what remains is to, is to envision our way forward. And, you know, I think so many people don't allow themselves the opportunity to grieve. They don't allow themselves to sit in, in the pain and the loss, uh, considering the species uh, loss, uh, the, the human life loss, the, the environmental loss uh, of, of a geography that used to love becoming a desert or, or whatever. And, and when you literally you sit in that and you feel that and it, it's painful and you cry a lot and you feel so, you so, so much despair, after a while, you know, after all of this grieving, then you you cannot help but start to think, okay, now what? You know, if if that's if that's gone, now what? And I think that grieving, uh, after you're grieving, it allows a window where you are able to start to picture the world you want, and 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 I. I think that's partly why I always ask, do, you know, people I talk to, I say, well, what do you want the world to be? Is this it? Is, is, is this your dream planet? Is this your dream, you know, relation with human and nature and human with human? And if not, you know, what is your vision of the, of the world you want? And what are you willing to do to make it? And, um, and so I ask myself those questions. And uh, as I said in some of the council sessions, I, I feel like um, for the last three years, I have been trying to figure my way. Um, f you know, how can I tell people, oh, you should switch to solar or wind, unless I've done it and understand what that feels like. And, and, and oh, you should try growing your own food. It's an incredibly powerful, moving experience and uh, really helps to tie you to not just what you eat, but where it comes from and how it arrives and, and, and the miracle of watching a plant grow. Um, so so I'm, I'm kind of teaching myself all of these processes and living through them so that I'm better able to say, well, have you tried this? It's so much fun. Or what is the thing that you love about this planet? What is it that you care so much about that you couldn't stand to know that it's gone? And what are you willing to do to, to protect it? When, when will you stand up and draw a line and say, not this one, not this tree, not this forest, not that animal? And so that's kind of where I am. That's how I, I keep going uh, day to day. Yeah. I was raised with incredible access to this uh, knowledge and awareness of everything being interconnected. My grandfather made really clear, <laughs> you know, that these are your relations. Everything was re related and that you had to respect it. Um, and uh, 
I honestly, I didn't realize other people weren't raised that way. It took a long time for me to realize, like, why are they, why are they calling that tree a resource or that river a resource or the salmon a resource? What the hell is that? And uh, I mean, I was obviously a little bit naive or, or I don't know why I didn't understand the difference. But when I understood just how different, how, how, how opposed in view it was, I, I really was like, well, that's got to change. <laughs> so with the climate, uh, I feel like for the last, you can almost say 500 years, indigenous people have sort of, one, been recouping because it was a devastating blow to, you know, real genocide. Uh, but they've also been sort of uh, standing by the sidelines, waiting, waiting for, it's almost like they're off stage, waiting for the right moment to be like, ta-da! <laughs> and I, I feel like that moment has beautifully arisen. You know, the Idle No More movement and Indigenous Rising has really, uh, you know, warms the cockles of my soul um, to see people who, who can remind the rest of humanity of a middle ground because now those indigenous people have been exposed to Western culture for so long, you know, there, there is no going back. But you can say as we go forward, Let's start, to, let's start to consider seven generations into the future. Each time we make a decision for whatever product it is in our company or whatever dam we're proposing to build or, you know, when you, when you start to have this shift in perspective where, where you have this different voice and these people are saying, have you thought about it this way? Because, you know, we both care about the same things. We might have a different language for it, but you want your grandchildren to have a viable future, healthy, you know, um, flourishing life on this planet. And I do too. So I, I feel like uh, the indigenous uh, voices that are starting to be heard are incredibly important and, and may, may hold the key. If, 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 and, you know, if white arrogance will listen. If you could just admit that maybe it's tried it, time to try something different. I've tried to do some of the things he actually did, like, you know, um, when from the age of five to 13, every day after school, I would have to sit outside for an hour. It didn't matter whether it was snowing, raining, sunny, it didn't matter. And I wasn't allowed to move more than the circumference of my arms. And after an hour, he'd call me and he'd say, what did you see? And, you know, sometimes I was feeling, you know, defiant. I'd say, I didn't see nothing, Grandpa. And he'd say, go back outside. And I'd be like, ah. Oh. So, so, but I tried that with my daughter and she was like, uh-uh. <laughs> you know, like, like, I, was, I was like, oh, okay. And unfortunately, like, I live on, in California which is a very different ecology. I don't, I don't know half of the trees the way that I did my Long Island, New York uh, habitat. And so I can't tell her which plants are great for this headache or that. And I feel like she is a different technical awareness of, of my knowledge, um, but she loves the stories. And, and you know, um, for example, she, we were walking past a tree recently and, and, and she, was like, she was like, don't step on the tree's trunk, you know, it's got feelings too, <laughs> or, you know, but, but that she, acknowledge, she acknowledges things in a way that I'm like, okay, she, she knows. And she has a great respect for animals and, and even as a, a baby, she loved playing with insects and spiders. She was not one of those who was fearful to have her hands in the, in the soil. So uh, I, I feel like she is a good, healthy balance of, of her incredible heritage. Um, but I, I've, I am, I'm trying, doing the best I can, trying to get her, keep her in touch with her, her indigenous roots. Um, and I can only do what I, what I can do, but the rest is up to her. She'll have to do some footwork too. <laughs>